another episode of Stoke Meter. And my goodness, I know we have some incredible guests, but I'm particularly amped about Bobby Gibb. Oh, so sweet. <laughs> How so are you, Bobby? I'm fine. Still running, full of beans, and just feeling great. Oh, that's fantastic. And just, just so, so everyone knows, in case you might not know, Bobby was the first woman to ever run the Boston Marathon. And we're going to get into that in a moment. But aside from uh, Karch up there, that is uh, my, my, of course, our, the co-facilitator, we also have Kinsey Middleton on, on here with us. And I thought it'd be really cool to have someone that was a beneficiary of the work that, uh, that Bobby did and being a pioneer in, in, in running the Boston Marathon because Kinsey is not only is she a fantastic coach to my daughter on the track team in high school here in Idaho, but she is the, also the former Canadian marathon champion. Wow. So welcome to Kinsey. I'm honored. Well. I'm honored. Hey. To <laughs> Kinsey. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Yeah, I'm very impressed. You're, you're doing great. You're carrying on the tradition and grand style. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Big shoes to feel, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I guess this is going to be a massive geek out session over here because this is really neat. And I've got to, I've got to also highlight some other amazing things about Bobby Gibb here. Um, not only was she the first woman to ever run the Boston Marathon, she also uh, used to practice law. She was is also a neuroscience researcher as well as an artist who does uh, sculptures, paintings, the whole bit there. And one of which, if you're not watching it, you're robbing yourself because there, there's an awesome painting behind her right oh, now. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you figured out that that was actually a painting. And yeah. it's, <laughs> it's, it's much too cool to be wallpaper. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of my abstract, more abstract paintings, yes. I yeah. love it. Well, oh, oh no, I'm sorry. I, I I keep on doing that. I apologize. <laughs> but, what you didn't do it? What did you do? No, no. I it, again. I'm <laughs> I'm still in geek out mode. And so oh, what I want to do is I'm just going to go straight to straight to. You've got to tell us how in the world did you get involved in running, and what were some of the things that got you to the Boston Marathon? I mean, can you? Can you take us through that story? Because I've read so many different accounts, but I just want to want to hear it from from you, from you. <laughs> okay, well, I got to set the stage for this because yes. I was, I um, when I I grew up in the fifties, mm -hmm. and in in at that time the role of women was very constrained, and uh, a professional women were very rare. It was difficult to get into medical school or law school or anything if you were a woman. And the women were generally considered to be the weaker sex. And that means weaker in body and weaker in mind. And the men were considered to be very the dominant ones. And uh, but the problem is the the men were also in, a, in, in their different little box. It was this is the damage that. Uh, prejudice and preconceptions and stereotypes too, because the men, men were supposed to be strong at all times and not show feelings, in fact, not even have any feelings. Mm -hmm. And for a man to be sensitive, and the men I know are very sensitive, gentle, wonderful people. And, and for all that time, they were denied that side of themselves. And, and no, they weren't even allowed in the delivery room. It's like, and the women weren't allowed in the boardrooms and men weren't allowed in the delivery rooms. It was very divided. And uh, this silly war between the sexes and these well, extremely rigid roles that we all were supposed to play. Well, I could see what was coming down the road as a teenager and I was rebelling against it. And I loved science and math. I loved running and horseback riding and running through the woods with the neighborhood dogs and all this. And, my mother kept saying, 
you you must stop running with the dogs. You must stop running in the woods. How are you ever going to find a husband, dear? <laughs> you, 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 you need to, you, you, ha you can't survive without a husband. You can't even get a credit card without your husband's permission. Oh, and man. and, so, and you, you, know, you never get a mortgage. You, you know, there are no jobs that pay anything for women out there. You, you got it. You, you got it. You got to have a husband to, to, you know, you're not going to be able to survive. And so uh, you got to, why don't you just take typing, dear, to have something to fall back on until you get married. And I said, but I like physics and math. I, I love the science. I love nature. I love being outside. I feel most like myself when I'm running through the woods with the neighborhood dogs. And she kind of shakes her head. <laughs> well, you're, you're never going to make it in this world. <laughs> And, and so this is the and, and as far as marathons, there was no New York marathon. There was no Chicago. There was no, not a, there was no running movement. And the second wave of the women's movement hadn't begun yet. We we got the vote back in the early 1920s. Finally, we had the vote. I mean, when my mother was a little girl, women were not allowed to vote. Wow. I mean, talk about like no civil rights. And uh, hardly any human rights <laughs> when you get right down to it. And my mother was so frustrated. She was a beautiful, intelligent woman. She wanted to be a reporter and travel the world. And instead, she's scrubbing floors and washing dishes and shopping. And I mean, she loved her family and everything, but she was so frustrated. She had to give up her dream. She felt like a captive in her own house. And, and and so did all her friends. And you know, they were all miserable. They're all drinking wine and taking tranquilizers to hide the pain. And so this is what I grew up in. And I was rebelling against this. I said, no way am I gonna live like this. And uh I'll go off into the wilds of Canada and live in a cabin with my dogs and my horses. <laughs> I'm not I might even have a few chickens and a goat. I'm not gonna live like this. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, my mother and I were always at odds because of the she thought, mm -hmm. well, it's for your own good, dear. I'm just telling you the reality of the situation. And young ladies, it's not proper for a young lady to be running, and especially in public. So this is what I grew up with. So that's sort of the background of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I just love to run for some reason. We all have our different loves, our different abilities. Some people love to swim. Some people love to bike ride, some people love physics, some people love economics. And, and I always feel that each person is such a unique individual. It's not the group you belong to, it's, 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 it's who you are as a person and everybody is so valuable and so different and so amazing. And everybody has different abilities and different loves. And, and so this, this is kind of my, my view of the world and I, I wanted things to open up so that I mean I, I, I say it's a democracy I and mean, we're all about the individual person and having human rights and civil rights and the right to become all that you can become in this world so so this is kind of was my viewpoint even at a fairly young age yeah. <clears throat> so that's so I just love, I love to run. So I saw the marathon. The Boston Marathon was the only marathon, major city marathon that I had ever heard about, ever. And I had no idea if there were any other marathons or not. I, I knew there was a, an original marathon event in, in, in Greece, ancient Greece, but I, I didn't know much about it at all. But I, I went with my dad and we went out Wellesley, which is about halfway mark. Yeah watch these runners go by and they were so amazing. They were so strong, so enduring, and you could hardly hear their footprints. It's tap, 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 yeah. tap. You no, know, and I'm going, I just fell in love with it. To me, it was something deeply human, deeply human about this, the endurance it takes, the integrity it takes to run like this. And I just fell in love with it. And it was totally irrational, but it was an inner decision. Like, these are my people. This is my tribe. I want to be with them. And I and I had no I never heard of the BAA, the Boston yeah. Athletic Association, yeah. or the AAU, the Amateur Athletic Union. I never knew, I never thought that the fact that they had numbers on them. You know, I was just, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was just enthralled with this. And so it was this inner decision just 
it, 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 that I made in, and I was going to run this race and I started a train and I didn't know how to train. There were no books. There was no magazines. There was, I had no coach. I just figured, well, I'll just keep, you know, try. I didn't even know if I could do it. I thought maybe I'll have a heart attack or I, I had no <laughs> idea what I was getting into. And so I just I started running. No, first, I remember the first mile I ran, I thought I was going to die. I, mean, <laughs> I was like, I, I was a, a sprinter. I was very, very fast. I was extremely fast and very light. And I loved to run and dance through the woods and stuff. But, you know, I'd run for a while and then I'd flop down on the forest floor and I'd look up through the pine trees and see the sun sparkling and the dogs would all be wagging their tails and pressing around me. And, but to run a concerted mile. So that was my first breakthrough. And then it went on from there. And then and I and I try to run a little further and then a little further and a little further. And a little, my boyfriend had a motorcycle and he'd take me on the motorcycle. We'd measure out miles and then he'd drop me off, you know, two miles, five miles, and eventually eight, nine, 10 miles from the house. And I'd run home. I'd run back to where I was living. I was taking care of three kids. I was the live-in nanny uh, at a, with his family. And uh, and the, the mother of the family, Gail, she and I became really good friends. And we talked, we talked a lot about our families and about our lives and so forth. And she was, she was very, very bright, very good sense of humor. Anyway, she's, she was a really good friend. She was older than me. She's about a decade older than I was. So, so anyway, and then, so I'd run. So my friend, my boyfriend would drop me off and I'd run home and he'd be sitting there on the couch with with the husband of the family. He became good friends with the husband of this family uh, that I was working with and living with. And uh, he'd say, oh, what took you so long? And I'd pop, <laughs> <laughs> I'd pop him with a pillow, you know. And, and so that's how I built up my distances uh, gradually, gradually, gradually. And, and, uh, and then in the summer of 1964, I took a 3,000 mile transcontinental um, road trip in my family's VW van, my mother and father. My father was a professor of chemistry and they'd go, gone off on a sabbatical. So uh, he made the big mistake of leaving the van for me, <laughs> for me to, to be in. I was very close with my dad because he and I shared a love of science and of nature. And, uh, and so anyway, and he, he was a lot like me uh, in, in many ways. Or I was a lot like him, I should say. <laughs> get, get, get the sequence right here. Yeah. So he, so, so I took the his van, which he loved. His van, he had it all fixed up like a camper inside, a boat, a boat. Because he loved boats, and so did I. We loved sailing. We had a little boat that we, our whole family would sail on. Anyway, he had it fixed up, and so I took off across the country. And at night, I would sleep out under the stars, and I had binoculars. Uh, he and I, he he had given me a telescope for Christmas, and he and I had spent many happy hours looking at the stars and the planets and so forth with his telescope. So I was, I had the binoculars, and I'd I'd fall asleep at night looking up at the stars, and then during the days I'd run in a different place all across the whole country, and I meet the people along the way. I mean, all kinds of different people to make up this country. It's just amazing. I mean, I I've always loved this country, and love the ge the geology of it and the just the physical beauty of it the people like people here from all over the world are here and and, and somehow they get along all the people that are fighting each other back <laughs> home here they they're all friends and they're intermarrying and you know we have an international family ourselves we've got you know intermarriage with you know people who come from all over the world and so I, I was just in love with the whole idea of democracy and human rights and, and civil rights. And, and of course, the civil right, rights movement was going yeah. on too. It's like, you know what? <laughs> this is what we stand for, is civil rights and, and human rights for every single person in this country and also in the world. And so I was in love with these ideas. And, and I thought, you know, this, 
people all most people what what do they want they don't want to fight wars they don't want to have all this crap crazy stuff going on they they want to have a safe place to live they want to have some source of income that's stable they want to have good education for their kids you know they want to have a happy peaceful life yeah. and so it, and i've seen over and over again if something happens like a disaster happens what what happens the people people all gather together and they help they help out they help out this is so basic to human nature it, like even now I mean, people are getting together and they're you know they they come for miles to help the people who've been hit by a cyclone or a tornado or you know and it's just like this is human nature this is what i want to see this is the world i want to see like stop killing each other for heaven's sakes work together you can make a better world we all work together we all make a better world it's ridiculous to be fighting over resources and territory if you know if you get together you can create more resources and you, you you can share territory you can you can you can each each country has something to produce that they can trade with another country i mean this is you know we can have such a beautiful world all together and so it's always t torn me apart to see the the, the you know the, the people hurting themselves and each other and uh, with totally unnecessary and ridiculous and in in it's it's unacceptable in my world <laughs> this is unacceptable <laughs> the, so anyway, this is a long diversion no this, it's not it's not a big question no it's not a long diversion simply because you in reading your story and in speaking with you there are so many assumptions that were burst that lead to all of these digressions and all these contentions and, and these different <laughs> yeah. things like this. I mean, heck, when you started running, they didn't even make a woman's running shoe. I no, <laughs> read that you were running in Red Cross nursing shoes when you right. first that's, started, right? Yes. Because the and again, another assumption was uh, from the race director uh, when you tried to apply for the first your first Boston Marathon. Will Clooney said or Cloney yeah. said yeah. that. Women aren't capable to run, are not physiologically capable right. to, to run that, right? So, right. That's what, that was the belief. That was the generally held belief. And so, you know, when I look out and see false beliefs keep us, keep us captive, you know, they mm -hmm. say truth will set you free. Well, that's true. And so, and I figured um, when I got that letter after training, I trained for two years, I wrote for my application to get a number. I get the letter back that you just mentioned. And I said, all the more reason to run, because if, <laughs> if, if, if I can prove this uh, false belief about women wrong, I can throw into question all the other false beliefs about women. <laughs> women are too stupid. Women are too weak. Women are too emotional, you know, on and on and on. These, all these false beliefs that have been used for years to keep women basically captive. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so... I wanted to, so now I had a mission. I wanted to change society. I wanted to change social consciousness um, about women. And, and so it, it was it, at that point when I got that letter, it, it, it was no longer just my, for my own uh, challenge and my own enjoyment. I, now I wanted to set women free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I've, I've got to ask Kinsey. You yeah. you heard I now you've been a passive observer right now. Hearing hearing this much so far in Bobby's story, what's your what what's going on in your mind? It's just <laughs> it's so incredible. I just keep like thanking my being able to grow up in an age where I am able to go out for a run and go do all of these races. Like it's it's come such a long way. And it's crazy that it wasn't that long ago that it was so restrictive and it's just it's so inspiring to hear your story and to hear all of the hurdles and obstacles that you push through and all of the amazing ideologies that you were able to parallel with running and just being able to like showcase what being on that start line meant so much more than just running the race I just think it's so commendable oh thanks well you guys are the main reason I ran it was to change the way society it was stacked up uh, so you, you could have these opportunities yeah well, I've, got to, I've got to say too one thing i really appreciate appreciate about your message bobby and you don't really hear this very often is you didn't come from an adversarial position 
yeah. you recognize that yep. this was also affecting men. Yes. Like they were, you know, I mean, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. It, yeah. It's like, it's more of a humanity approach. Like yes, whenever, exactly. whenever you hold someone else down, you're also holding the other equation down, other side of that equation down yeah. as well. Yeah. That's and, exactly right. Yeah. yeah. I see it all the time. I, I'm a, I'm a nurse. And yeah. even, even, you know, a couple decades ago when I was in school, you know, I, I experienced some of that in reverse. Absolutely, you know, yeah. It, it's interesting. So anyway, I, I thank you for, for that approach. I think that is really amazing. Oh, that is so sweet of you to say. And I have to say, all the men along the way have been so amazing yeah. um, in, in the race. And then uh, there were a lot of men working for uh, Title IX. And, and my, you know, the people I love most, my father and my son are men. You know, and it, it's just ridiculous. We're all human beings, and and I, and I, what's one thing I wanted to do is end this stupid war between the sexes, and yeah. and we we can't we we can't do this. It's you know we we gotta we all gotta be together. Yeah. Well, and that, another thing that that brings up right there is there was a, a woman named Catherine Switcher. She ran the race after you, and it's yes. a very common picture. There's some guy that's pulling her, trying to pull her off the thing, and. A lot of times that's attributed, that's the first one. No, no, no. We know who the real first woman was, right? Yeah. But it, it was so adversarial by way. But when you were talking about the, the men that you were running alongside with, right, they right. were pretty excited to have you there, right? And just, uh, yeah. I, yeah. Made, they, they, <clears throat> I was at first, I had a hood over my hair because I, I knew I was doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing I wasn't allowed and I thought I might be arrested or something so I and then they they quickly figured out I was a woman is, is studying my anatomy from the rear and I could hear them talking and <laughs> I said it took them about three minutes I have to give them credit and uh and that we you know I was laughing and you know they say I wish my wife would run I wish my girlfriend would run I mean these guys are so nice and I said, well, I'm afraid if I take off this hood, they'll see I'm a woman, throw me out. They said, we won't let them throw you out. It's a free yeah. road. So they were protective. And so that's what I wanted to do. Was just, and, I, and Jock Semple is the sweetest man. He's the sweetest guy. After the race in 1966, I met him. My mother and I went in and we, we took back, they'd given me a wool blanket at the finish to wear. And I, we took back the wool blanket. We met him. He was so sweet. He said, I'm not against women. He said, I just, it's the rules, you know, if, if, there's, a, if there's an unqualified runner in the race, which Switzer, of course, was because she had an illegal number. It was a men's division race and women aren't, you know, everybody in the world knows that men don't run or participate in women's division. I mean, it was, well, suppose a man turned up at the women's gymnastics in the Olympics, you know, I mean, he yeah. gets problem <laughs> it, it just, you, you just don't do it you know and so so uh, it was a, so the problem is that the, his whole race could lose his accreditation yeah. if there's if it's, if there's an illegal or uh, unqualified runner so he was trying to grab the number off her he wasn't attacking her he was just trying to get his number off this illegal runner and yeah. then and then there was some bodyguard or something that knocked him to the road. He's an older man. I mean, yeah. for heaven's sakes, he's so sweet. And and it just burns me up because his reputation is being trampled on uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in a way that is un, unfair and untrue. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. OK, well, again, there's, there's that that fairness and that, you know what yep. I mean? Yep. It's almost it, like 1960s clickbait. We're gonna, yeah. we're gonna put forward a narrative that fits what we want to say when that really wasn't the case at all. Yeah. No, kids, no, no. And it, it does some some people profit by, um, you know, not being quite honest and and uh, claiming more than they should claim. Yeah. And I, and I and I don't think that's right. I mean, I I do believe honesty is so important. I mean, that's yeah. the basis of trust and. How can you have a society if you don't have trust among people? That's the whole thing that holds us together. It's the glue. What if you put your money in the bank and you couldn't trust the banker whether it's going to be there or not, or he's taking a vacation somewhere on your money? You know, 
you have to trust. It has to be trust. And yes. and so so well, it bothers me. Yeah. Well, and you saw that when you were traveling across the country too. I think one of the the great things about travel, no matter how far it is, is getting face to face with people of different walk walks of life yes. and different yes. circumstances. Right. It's it's rare that you see people having major differences if they've had a chance to talk to each other and yep. get to know each other. One hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. In my world, everybody's friends, and in you know, you make friends with people all over the world, which is one great thing about Zoom, by the way. You can you can make yeah. friends all over the world, and so. <laughs> It's so cool. true so <laughs> true well it Kinsey, i had to go back to you too because when when I, when i saw what after hearing bobby talking about the man trying to rip the number off it you go whoa what really that really happened i mean what was, what was going through your thought <laughs> right then <laughs> well i mean i didn't know there was another see i ran in 1966 which is yeah. a, a year before this yeah. this other incident in 1967 i came back and I ran again. And this year, everyone knew there was going to be a women woman running running because the press, who had yeah. followed me the year before, um, they were calling my parents and say, "Is she coming? Is she going to run? Is she going to you know?" And all this, and they say, "Well, yes, she's here, but she's sick." And I got sick on the plane. I had the flu. We don't know if she's going to be able to run. So they already knew there was going to be a woman running. So. In 1967, I didn't have to hide in the bushes. Everybody knew I was <laughs> the press was interviewing me. I stood on the line with the men. I stood right there on the line behind the men a little bit because I didn't want to interfere with the front runners. And yeah. then I waited. I waited until the front runners had gone. And the Japanese won that year. And they were fantastic. They were so, so, so strong and so fast. And so I was out of their way. I didn't want to interfere with that. I just waited for a while, you know, a few minutes, and then uh, then I started to run. And I got to the finish line. Well, actually, I had about after about half an hour of running, because I was so sick, I uh, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't, mm. and I lay down on somebody's lawn, and they they were they're calling, trying to call my father and call an ambulance and so forth. And I, I couldn't breathe. And then suddenly, uh, uh, amazingly, I must have laid there for, I don't know, 10, 20 minutes. And then suddenly, whatever this cramp was in my uh, lungs gave gave way and released. And to everyone's astonishment, I sprang up off the grass <laughs> and ran the rest of the way to Boston. And so, so and then I, uh, and, uh, and I got home and I didn't know there was another woman in the race until I read the paper that night, and it was no longer front page headlines. And in 1966, it was front page headlines. Yeah. Uh, pub bride, first woman to run marathon, and it was unheard of. It was like shocked the world. It went all over the world by wire. We we our fr my parents have friends in Malaysia, and uh, people in Malaysia wrote them a letter and said, "We see in the local paper." That your daughter is is <laughs> impossible and and run the marathon, and and so it it really that was a pivotal event. It really changed the way people thought about women. Some people still couldn't believe it. They still it was so unbelievable. I mean, women bake cookies. They don't run marathons. You know, <laughs> we get these stereotypes. So yeah. yeah. So so then I saw I finished about an hour ahead of Kathy. Yeah. And it was on the sports page, no longer front page. On the sports page is a picture of me and a picture. And I see this brawl going on. And I said, oh, my God, my heart sank. I thought, now this is a very negative thing. This is yeah. going to set women's running back. This is not, not what I wanted. I wanted this to end the war between the sexes. And here it is, the war between the sexes. Only it's being so twisted and misinterpreted. It wasn't a war between us. It's not the men were these bad guys who were attacking women. That was not true. It was a woman who had gotten an illegal number and and was threatening the very existence of the marathon in this outraged jock trying to grab the number. And so it, it just, you know, and that thing has gone all over the place and it's become, you know, a publicity tool uh to enhance one person at the expense of other people 
and it, it, it's it, I, i'm sorry but it's just not right no no you're good and and kinsey i what, what were what was your thought there oh i just thought it was i was curious actually what um what the public's reaction was that first year um having found out once you finished the race and everything was it generally like a positive response and then the the negativity kind of only happened that next year when it looked like there was the brawl and everything on the course or was it um kind of a mixed response your first year i'm curious how, oh, yeah. how the public reacted to the first I ever woman yeah that's a very good question because i had no idea sometimes when you do something that far out the social norm people can be hostile mm-hmm. and, and the runners could have been hostile they could have easily sh- shoulder me out uh, that first year was totally positive and I took off the hood and everybody could see it. And then for a moment, there was a stunned silence, like, whoa, what's this? And then, you know, the guys would start to go, add a girl, girl, add a girl. And the women started screaming and they're jumping <laughs> up and down. And I get to Wellesley, which, as yeah. I said, about halfway, it's a well, Wellesley is a women's college. And the women were all out in the streets screaming. And in those days, they had a tunnel. They'd face each other and you run through the tunnel. And... Uh, and they were they were just, you know, later on, uh, Diana Chapman Walsh, who became president of Wellesley, at that point, she was a student and she was there. Oh, wow. And she, she said, in 1996, I met her again in 19, I'm digressing a bit, but 1996, the BAA officially recognized my three wins in those three years and gave me a medal and inscribed my name on the winner's circle. And that was 1996. Well, I... Then I talked with Diana Walsh and she wrote a beautiful article for the paper. And she said, we knew that Bobby was coming because it was being broadcast on the radio (laughs) in my progress along the way. And they let out a shriek when I came and they were jumping up and down and people, the women were crying. And one woman, she's going, Ave Maria, Ave Maria. (laughs) And it's like, it was at that moment when we knew, everyone, we all knew that we're we're never going to go back to the way it was before. That something had changed. That was what I wanted. That's exactly what I wanted to happen. That we're not going to go back to the old way anymore. This is the beginning of something new, and <clears throat> and so it was positive all the way. That people were positive, and I get to the finish line. The governor of Massachusetts heard I was running and came down and shook my hand. The press, I had never met the press before, anyone from the press. I was so, I was more impressed with them. I thought, wow, <laughs> this is amazing. And, and so, I was, and so uh, they were all interested in my story and so forth. And I get home um, that day and the, the car is parked all up and down the street. And I said, somebody must be having a party. I get to my house. <laughs> and it was the press, they were all there. My poor parents standing there in the middle of the living room, totally be- bewildered. Like <laughs> when I had come home and to- I come home from California by bus uh, and I'd arrived the night before and uh, and uh, I called them on the phone and I said, I'm in Boston. And, and they said, well, what are you doing in Boston? And I said, I've come to wa- run the Boston Marathon. Now they did not know I was training. I had not told them because I knew they would try to stop me. And so I said, I'm, I'm in Boston, I'm going to run the Boston Marathon. And they actually thought I had, I'd, I'd be, I was delusional that somehow I'd gone around the bend. Finally, I mean, she was crazy enough running in the woods with the dogs. And now this is really, she's really, she's really lost it now. And so I get home and they were really upset and thought they, thought they thought I was actually going to run. And my mother had spent her, her almost her entire adult life trying to get me to conform to these same deadening norms that it made her life so miserable. And but before the marathon, so there I am the day of the marathon, um, April 19th, 1966. How do I get to Hopkinton? How do I get to Hopkins? I don't have a car. There's no bus that goes there. And so I said, Mom, <laughs> Mom, you got to drive me. Don't you see? I've been training for two years for this. And they think that women can't do this. If I do this thing, if I run this marathon, it's going to help to set women free. 
you're not happy. You know, no, none of your friends are happy. I guess it's going to change things. And so, and so she, you know, I could see she was moved. Like tear come to her eyes, her lips start to quiver. And she says, okay, get the keys, get the keys. She says, get the keys. Oh, mom, you know, this is amazing. So we're driving out to Hopkinton before the race. And, and, uh, and, and, I, and I said, you know, I've always, it's the first time in our entire adult life that we'd ever talked honestly to each other, which, mm. which in my, my mind is supposed to be the core of the women's movement is that women become honest with each other and they begin to help each other instead of competing with each other and trying to put each other down and, and, and all this. Women begin to trust each other and build that sister sisterhood. And so, so I said, mom, uh, you know, I've always loved the real you under all this, this cloud of tranquilizers and alcohol that yeah. you're using to dull the pain. And she said, well, to tell you the truth, I've always envied your freedom and and your spirit wow. and uh she said and she said i might cry because I, I love my mother you know <laughs> and and uh she said um and then she said well i was trying to get you to conform i was trying to break your your spirit and make you conform for your own good it was because i loved you that i was doing this and she says thank god i failed <laughs> 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 and, you know and that was like it was so amazing because we hugged for the first time I could ever remember since I was a little kid, and and uh, and you know she, and, and then ever since then we've been friends. That's, That's amazing! Amazing. Yeah. amazing! What an amazing story! Thank you for for sharing that from a from again a vulnerable position. That's a, it's it. When I look at what what you set in motion, first well, first of all, I got to show you this. This is this is my wife's Boston Marathon oh, your long wife. sleeve T-shirt. Amazing. She would she would have never been able to do this. This is in two thousand three before our first kid came in, uh, and uh, she did great. She did she did fantastically there, and it was all because of you. I looked at the statistics. And they said it's this past year. Now Boston Marathon is going to be running next week, right, or or two weeks from now, right? Uh, yeah. Well, Definitely. last year it was forty three percent women that yes. that yeah. ran. Forty three percent. That's what I wanted. And then I want to say another thing about the Boston Marathon. At the Boston Marathon in the seventy in nineteen seventies, we used to have what we called love ins, and there would be like. Hundreds of people would all get together and they would just sit there and love each other. And, you know, it was amazing. It was really an amazing experience. Love. And so it's like, to me, the Boston Marathon is like a big love in and we all get together. And these people from all over the world, all political persuasions, all genders, all, you know, all races, all ethnic groups, we're all there and we just love each other and we're talking and we're hugging each other. And, and there are, and all these stupid boundaries and divisions and so fears and hates that people draw against each other just didn't don't exist there. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, if we can do it in Boston, we can do it in the world. Mm -hmm. that, that's this is my next project. <laughs> my next project is. Well, you I, know, I, I, I don't wonder. Raise, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say to raise human consciousness you know, to the next level. So we're not killing each other. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, for one human being to kill another human being, this is unacceptable. This is horrible. It's horrible. It's a horrible thing. We can't do this. This is wrong. It's against everything we feel inside. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, we're not like this. We're, we're creatures who empathize with each other normally. And so anyway, so that, that's, you know, that's, that's what I'm trying to I mean, I, I'd love to do, do, to, to make this new world. <laughs> yeah, I love it. It, it. Set it in motion. Sorry, yeah. go ahead, man. Well, I was going to say, I mean, I, I think you probably don't even understand. I don't know if there's a way you could understand is, you know, you didn't just open up gates for female runners. I mean, like you said, you were, you were always into the sciences and you were looking at pre-med and, yeah. 
I know that, so I'm in Southern Arizona and I, I know it's, it's been within the last, at least definitely within the last 10 years, maybe in the last five years that the, the medical um, school was over 50% women. Wow. Yeah. And it's happened multiple times. And so, wow. you know, again, you'll never know the impact of what you did yeah. is it's far reaching. You know what I mean? And I, and I, I would attribute, there's a, a piece of that event happening, even in the medical world, that you helped set in motion. That's in what I wanted. I wanted to throw into question all these stereotypes that we use for, to keep ourselves and each other in these little boxes. We, you know, so that, that's, that's what I envisioned. I, I wanted that to happen. I'm glad it did. It wasn't just me. There were hundreds of millions of people who made it happen. Yeah. But... But it was like a pivotal event. You were an igniter. I haven't seen any industry or anything where having a balance of both sexes hasn't been a win to, yeah. some, you know, to some degree. It's so true. Um, it's who you are as a person that really counts. Is. Yeah, that's what exactly. I was. I do believe we all came here with something to give the world. Yeah. Something good to give the world. So I'm, I'm going to go back to my daughter's high school coach in the corner over there. At least on my screen, it is. What, yeah, you, what, kind, yeah, what <laughs> kind of thing do you think is going to, from the conversation you've been listening to, Kinsey, is relevant for the kids nowadays? As far as, you know, the track team, cross country, all that, all that bit. Yeah, this generation is is so lucky because they have, multiple generations of women that they can look back on and see the the progress that has been made and so it's a it's a great time for them to be in high school and to be inspired because if they they don't have to look very far to see so many different stories and like they can hear Bobby's story and see how far it's come since then and then I can share my story with them of just not having to deal with these obstacles and like just how the work that she put into motion has allowed um, women of, of my uh, my age to run and around the world and meet. And I've experienced really similar, similarly to her in the sense of um, everywhere I've traveled for running, meeting people from all walks of life all over the world, there is just such like a kindness. It's running is such a microcosm of the world and it just like the best people. Um, so I feel like if you're running, you're happy. And if we can just put that into the world a little bit more and spread it throughout our other areas of life, like it's, um, it'd be a beautiful thing. And so I think that the kids have such a great opportunity ahead of them. And if they just can continue to enjoy the sport, I think that's the biggest thing that we all have like talked a little bit or hinted a little bit about is that it all stems from the joy, right? Of the desire to go out for a run. And, and I think that um, I've always argued with the, oh, I just want to suffer through the pain and all of that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm much more a fan of the, hey, we love being here. We love doing this. Let's spread the message of this is, <laughs> this is fun. This is team building. This is, um, this is a joy. And so I hope that the, the kids can see that through all of our stories a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So millions of people are responsible for changing the consciousness of the world. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. Well, yeah. what I think is interesting too. So in the podcast, I mean, we've, we've interviewed, you know, female fighter pilots and people, right. get, you know, in sculpture and art and all these different areas. And one thing that, that is clear is there's, you guys are the torch bearers, but it's, it's like, it, there's still so much ground that, that needs to be covered. There's right. still, we need to have that ongoing presence of people that are willing to pass that torch to the next generation. So I, you know, Kinsey with your team, again, with them, it's not all about, right? They're gonna take that into their careers. They're gonna take yeah. that into their families. They're gonna pass that on to their children, Yep. you know? And, and it's amazing how many areas in 2023 that are still, yeah. there's still so much, so much progress that can be made. Yeah, that's so true. That's a trend, and not just in the gender department, but also just in human consciousness as a whole, yeah. seeing ourselves as part of the earth, part of this beautiful earth, and 
as part of each other and yeah. you know it's a it's a it's a different kind of consciousness that we need to get us into the future yes it's I, one one time we're going hopefully you'll give us some other time at another date to go into your neuroscience because i know th that that has been pivotal into in in all kinds of performance whether it be professional or sports or whatever it might be and just just seeing what everything that you've you've pioneered um and and sometimes without really intending to be such a such a, a big thing my goodness, from that perspective, it'd be amazing as well. So I, I can't, again, this is, this has been wonderful. It's been enlightening, but more importantly, it's been incredibly inspiring, inspiring to action. And uh -huh. I want to thank you for taking that, that step. It's so many years. I mean, that's 59 years ago, no, 58 years ago now. Right. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. wow. Wow. Well, I, I wanted to show that women could do all kinds of things, art and, I mean, painting, sculpture, and uh, science, and law, and, you know, I just, I kind of, and I was curious about everything. I wanted to know how the world works and stuff, so, it, and so it, it was. I just wanted to, to show people that women can do this stuff, and, and the millions of other women have gone even way beyond what I was doing in, in their careers and so forth so i you know i love to i love to do art that's that's my it was my hobby and now it's it's what i do is the art yes. and running i mean i wrote a book called wind in the fire mm -hmm. which is about those two years that i trained for the marathon yeah well and, there was another we, oh go i'm sorry i, I completely talked over here no go ahead go ahead no, I, there was another book that uh, that so many kids read now, and, and that is The Girl Who Ran. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's a great it's job. With that. Inspiring from a very young age. Yeah. And amazing. I'm sorry for cutting you off. I completely uh, yeah. didn't mean that. No, no. I uh, we're, we're just eager. We're all eager talking <laughs> right here. So, no, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> so. Perfect. But anyway, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's well, all good. Uh, want to thank you though for being the first and oh, sometimes it's the hardest thing to do but yeah. uh, before before we sign off though can you hold on just for a second and then uh and visit with you post post show okay yep <laughs> all right well thank, thank you, you for thank your you time Bobby. Yeah, thank you both <laughs> Thank you.